name is Cindy Kunis. My name is Cindy Kunis, and I'm Projects Coordinator for the Delaware River Greenway Partnership. The DRGP promotes, preserves, and protects the Delaware River. Our programs include the Delaware River Scenic Byway, Lower Delaware Wild Scenic, Heritage Trail, and Delaware River Water Trail. Please allow me to introduce our speaker, Paul Shope. He will present steamboats on the Upper Delaware. A little bit about Mr. Shope. During his career as a professional historian, his specializations included transportation history, South Jersey and Delaware Valley history, and black history in South Jersey. He served as executive director of the Camden County Historical Society for four years. And at Stockton University, he serves as assistant director of the South Jersey Culture and History Center. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy. Okay, thank you very much, Cindy. And I'm very happy to be on board with you tonight to uh, talk a little bit about the Upper Delaware River uh, steamers. Uh, when I talk about the Upper Delaware River in the age of steamers, uh, I'm referring to uh, from Market Street, Philadelphia up to Trenton. I know a lot of people think of the Upper Delaware as above the falls in Trenton, but uh, this is for navigational purposes. They, the dividing line was Market Street in Philadelphia. So uh, the first steamboat to be on the Delaware River was John Pitch's steamboat of August 18, 1787. Uh, Pitch was uh, from Bucks County. He trialed some model steamboats in a pond up there uh, before building a larger vessel uh, that was moved by oars alongside of the uh, alongside of the boat. Uh, this particular vessel, uh, the the Continental, I'm sorry, the Constitutional convention um, delegates came down to watch it move along the water. Uh, within a couple of years, uh, Pitch built a second boat with oars in the, in the back, um, applied for and received a, a, a monopoly for transportation on the Delaware by, by steam. Uh, but then in 1791, the, the uh, federal government issued him a patent for uh, his steamboat but at the same time, on the same day, they issued one to James Rumsey, and they also had issued patents for steam to uh, uh, Nathan Reed and also John Stevens, the father of American railroads. Uh, so when Fitch was building his third boat, the Perseverance, uh, for sale down in Virginia, a major storm came up, blew it off its stocks, and drove it across the Delaware to wreck on the shores of Petty's Island. And uh, he left it there. He went over, he, he removed all the machinery. He left the hole there and just left town, went down to Virgi Virginia and then eventually to Kentucky where uh, he died in Bairdtown, Kentucky in 1798, uh, reportedly of, of uh, self-inflicted, uh, um, well, of a suicide. So the next steamboat to come to the Delaware River was John uh, Stevens Steamboat Phoenix which was also the very first steamboat to sail in the open ocean because he moved this from Hoboken uh, down along the Jersey coast and up to, through Delaware Bay to the Delaware River to use the, as a uh, ferry boat. So this was the very first one to uh, move on, on uh, open water. And then of course, some of the early boats, this is the, uh, the steamer Philadelphia, also known as Old Sal. Um, and uh, this is how a lot of the early boats looked. And of course, a boat named for him, John Stevens, was operated by the Camden and Amboy Railroad uh, to, uh, to ferry passengers between Bordentown, actually White Hill and Fieldsboro, down to Philadelphia. And a little bit later, the Edwin Forrest was built, and she's named for uh, uh, the famous actor. There was an Edward Far Edwin Forrest uh, uh, retirement home for actors in, in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and sometimes this boat could be seen uh, moving up the, into the lower Rancocas Creek. But uh, the boats I'm here to talk to you about primarily are the boats that belong to the Upper Delaware River Transportation Company, also known as the Upper Delaware River Navigation Company. And these are the steamers Columbia, the John A. Werner, the Twilight, and of course later the Trenton. 
And the, the three, the Columbia, the John A. Werner, and the Trenton were, uh, Twilight were known as the three musketeers of the upper Delaware River. This was the steamer Columbia. She was built in the centennial year of 1876 for Captain Jonathan Cohn in, by Harlan and Hollingsworth in Wilmington, Delaware, who uh, arguably built the best palace steamers uh, for use on the Delaware and elsewhere. Um, the Columbia measured uh, 220 feet long, 34 feet wide, and uh, she was always the finest steamer to travel on the Delaware. She was always laid up at the end of the season, repainted, redecorated. She always had the best bands on board for dances and for listening. Uh, she was really the queen of the Three Musketeers, if I can say that. It's really not a, why well, she was the best musketeer. And then, of course, the next one was in John A. Werner, also built in Wilmington. Uh, the Werner measured uh, 212 feet long, 28 feet wide. She was built in 1857 and uh, was used as a messenger uh, boat down in the, the Chesapeake uh, during the Civil War and also brought back to the Delaware and used to transport the wounded and dying from, um, uh, from Philadelphia up to Beverly where they were unloaded and taken to a new Union Hospital there in Beverly, New Jersey. Later, she was renamed the Burlington in 1905 when uh, the company went through a receivership uh, but she was still operating just fine. Here she's shown tied up at the uh, freight warehouse in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Behind her is the little slip for the, uh, the ferry boat that ran between Burlington and Bristol. We'll see more of that later. And here's the lowliest of the fleet. This was the Twilight. Not unusual that there's a rope dragging in the water. Uh, the Twilight was captained by uh, Gus Worrell, who had the best set of sideburn whiskers since the Civil War days. Uh, Gus would uh, allow the uh, young men, the wharf rats who hung around, and he would allow them to load the, all the uh, truck and, and uh, merchandise on board the Twilight uh, for shipment to Philadelphia or elsewhere. And if they did a really good job, he'd stand up there on the bridge and he'd throw a handful of pennies down. And, and the melee that ensued was not to be believed. Um, many a boy got a strapping for coming home with a torn uh, a shirt or a shiner or bruises, but, uh, uh, but the boys all loved Captain Gus. So this is a schedule from 1901. It shows by this time they're operating the Twilight, the Poconoke, the John Sylvester, the Columbia, the John A. Werner, and the Diamond State. And here's the inside of the schedule. Uh, they would stop at um, Florence and Bristol and, and Burlington Island and Burlington and Beverly, Delanco, Torsdale, Riverton and Tacconi before arriving in Philadelphia or vice versa. Uh, all of the uh, boats for this, for this company left from uh, the Chestnut Street Wharf. But this is the John Sylvester. She was a bit of a vagabond and here she's seen sunk off Bergen Point up in North Jersey. And uh, uh, she was a uh, Principally made of wood, she was built in 1866, uh, 193 feet long, 30 feet wide. And here's the Poconoke. Uh, when this first arrived in the Delaware, the, the wharf rats would scratch their heads. You know, one made a move, there's no side wheel. Well, the Poconoke had a screw or a propeller on their stern uh, that made her move through the water. And uh, of course, the boys prided themselves on knowing the different whistles of the of the uh, of the steamboats, and the Poconoke had a, a strange shrill whistle, so they always could hear her coming about two or three miles away. And here's the Diamond State. The Diamond State was built in Marine City, Michigan. She was originally named the Unique, and she surely was. She had quadruple expansion engines on board, and was the fastest vessel on the river. She measured 163. Uh, feet long and 20 feet wide. She was uh, also nicknamed the Astonishment of All Rivers. So here we are at Chestnut Street looking up Delaware Avenue. We're looking at the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Ferry House at the foot of Market Street. Over on the right, you can see a, a sign for a steamer, the Sylvan Dell, headed for Bridgeton. Uh, there's a freight boat pulled into that, into that quay. Um, and you can see all the different businesses that used to line Delaware Avenue. And we've arrived at the Chester Street Wharf. 
Uh, here we have a two-masted schooner uh, laying up at the wharf. The steamers would pull him ahead of the her. And here's the Columbia tied up there at Chestnut Street. Across the, across the, uh, the quay was the, um, uh, the ferry house. You can see it with the steeple there, the ferry house for the Philadelphia and Reading Atlantic City Railroad. So let's get underway. We're on board the steamer here. We're going by the the, uh, the hoods covering the uh, slips for the car, for the ferries uh, at the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, uh, Ferry House. And here she is, a little further away, as we move out into the open river. Of course, by this time the uh, Smith the Smith and Windmill Island had been extricated from the river, so there was plenty of good blue water to to uh, move through. Uh, on board the uh, the steamer, and uh, we're moving uh, further up river, and looking over to the Camden side. This was the uh, the, the ferry house built in 1899 for the Pennsylvania Railroad ferries coming over from Market Street. And moving up towards Cooper's Point in Camden, which is John H. Mathis and Company shipyard, it built many a, a coastal schooner and three masted ships and a whole variety of vessels. And around uh, the corner, around the the, uh, uh, the point from her was the Camden Shipbuilding Company, where we have a nice uh, three-masted uh, ship being built. And moving on up the river, we see uh, the Vine Street Pier and some of the other commercial piers uh, available for shipping. And this is the uh, Warp and Dock uh, Administration's uh, M.E. Quay uh, tugboat tied up there at the end of Vine Street. And of course, we're passing the Cramp Shipyard, which opened in 1830, built wooden vessels and made the transition to building iron vessels and continued building until 1927. She was the source of the primary source of the Delaware River being dubbed the, uh, the American Clyde uh, as reference to the Scottish River with all the ship boats, the shipyards on it. And, uh, she built all kinds of vessels, warships, cruise ships, uh, steamships for uh, trans transoceanic travel. So here they're preparing for a launch. And occasionally you would see a Wilson line uh, vessel going above Market Street. They normally went from Market Street down to Wilmington and uh, had sightseeing trips. So this was probably one of the sightseeing trips. And... Uh, I believe that's the uh, Delaware station there in the background. And also if we look, turn, turn your head towards the Jersey side, you'll be passing Petty's Island and up at the north end of the island, there's a notch in the island that remains there today. And this was put in by Joseph Rylett, who came down from Schuylkill Haven, Pennsylvania, where he built canal boats and he came down here to Petty's Island to establish a repair yard and also a construction yard. Um, and most of the buildings here You'll see we're on skids so that they could be moved. There's one of the shop buildings, some of the houses where the workers lived. And there's part of the notch there that's uh, still there today. So now we're moving up past Port Richmond. This is the grain elevator that could load uh, four ships simultaneously. Port Richmond was a huge uh, Philadelphia and Reading uh, facility built established in 1836 for primarily shipping anthracite uh, to ports around the world. But eventually it became, uh, it, could, it could handle any kind of merchandise, grain, and, uh, you know, freight, any, anything that needed to be carried could go out of Port Richmond. When Conrail came into existence on April 1st, 18, in 1976, the first thing they did was shut down Port Richmond which is a shame. So then we come up to the uh, Delaire Railroad Bridge. This was completed in 1896. It needed a uh, uh, permission from the War Department to build it. It is the first bridge south of Trenton uh, for crossing the Delaware River. Um, and this allowed the Pennsylvania Railroad to move not only trains to the shore, but also produce trains coming up out of South Jersey when it was definitely known as the Garden State. Uh, the, the small span that you see there was the original swing span that operated with a uh, with a uh, stationary donkey engine. 
And here, Cup, Captain Gus has sounded a long blast, a short blast for the bridge tender to open the bridge. And here's the twilight going through the open draw. And we're, we're coming up to the mouth of Pensalkin Creek, which saw a little bit of steamboat activity, steam, steam tug activity. Uh, they would haul barges of manure up in the spring and uh, take produce down in the fall. They would use very small tugboats with hinged smokestacks that could get under the bridges. They had to navigate, and here's another shot here of the railroad bridge and the trolley bridge right next to each other, one to Pensalkin. And the head of navigation was uh, Port Landing uh, in Cinnamon Township. And to give you an idea, there was a uh, uh, plenty mill, lumber, coal, and lime yard there at Port Landing. You can see one of the barges. So we're back out on the river. We're going up past Wissanomi. You can see on the left there the little crop colony of, of boathouses that Wissanomi was long famous for. And here's the steamer fish hawk, which was a floating shad hatchery tied up at the Wissanomi Pier. The stiff leg derrick there was primarily used for unloading blocks of, of stone uh, that a stone cutter would use to make uh, cemetery memorials. And if you look closely, you'll see this, this crew uh, sitting on the, on the porch of the Takoni Yacht Club. The shad fishing was, uh, was a commercial industry along the Delaware. Uh, most of the fishing uh, below Tully Town area was done on the Jersey side of the river because that was a lake shore and the uh, Philadelphia side was a cutting shore. So most of the fisheries existed on the Jersey side. Here we are in the Palmyra Riverton area. And we're approaching uh, uh, Riverton. That's one of the Fittler houses there on the right. You can see a steamer tied up at the, uh, or approaching the wharf up there on the left, on the left side of the trees. These are some of the uh, founders' homes. The Riverton was founded in 1851 by primarily uh, Quaker merchants from Philadelphia who sought to escape the, uh, uh, the heat of the summer and, and all the diseases and smells that went with it. And so they originally only really occupied these mansions um, in the summertime. You can see the Yacht Club and, and uh, Steamboat Pier coming up on the left. And there's a better view of it. There's the Columbia approaching the pier. The, uh, the Yacht Club uh, built in Bates 1880. And prior to that, there was a small building on, on the pier called the, uh, the Station House. And they only allowed the Yacht Club to build their clubhouse on the pier because if they allow, if they set aside one of the ground floor rooms uh, for steamboat passengers to wait. And so that's what they did. So originally one of those rooms, and I believe it's the one on the right, uh, was, was for waiting passengers. Here's a shot of, a, I believe this is the Bristol approaching the, uh, the Yacht Club. No shot of the uh, steamer Burlington leaving the Yacht Club headed for Philadelphia. In the background, you can see the distance uh, Keystone Saw Works, as well as the Urban Search Full Scouring Mill. And here's the Columbia. Look at the crowd on that Columbia. It's just jam packed with people. She had a beautiful walking beam engine that drove the uh, uh, drove the, the side wheelers for her. And they did chat fishing in Riverton as well. This is in the cove just above the yacht club. And moving on further towards uh, the Pompeston Creek. There we go. Going up river now. And we've approached the uh, mouth of the Rancocas Creek, which had its own set of steamboats. Uh, in the distance over there on the on the far shore, you can see some of the boathouses, uh, clubhouses that belong to uh, Philadelphia businessmen that were in Delanco. So the Vanscaver line was kind of the last steamboat line on the Rancocas, and they put out this brochure for the 1907 season. This was really the last hurrah. Uh, they kept one steamer operating until 1910, but most of the steamers were gone 
by, by the end of the 07 season, sent down to uh, Albemarle Sound, a North River area of Virginia and, and North Carolina. Uh, they only had the, the Annie that was still running, which I'll talk about in a minute. That's that's a picture of the Annie on the uh, front of the brochure. And uh, it talks about the uh, the beauty of the Rancocas and the cost. Vance got relying converted to trucks and uh, they operated out of Philadelphia for quite a long time. This was their original wharf at the foot of Calla Hill Street. And you can see the uh, Philadelphia Red Cocos and Mount Transportation Company, steamer Annie L. Vanskyver, leaving for Riverside, Delanco, Bridgeboro, Adams Wharf, Grand Cocos, Centerton, Haynesport, Lumberton, and Mount Laurel. Adams Wharf was located in Willingboro at the foot of the old Salem Road. And this was her first vessel. This is the Marietta. She was built in uh, 1887 out on Petty's Island by Dowdy and Capella who had taken over the yard originally established by Cramp for building uh, clipper ships. You can see she's there for the worship parade. And Delaware Avenue is just starting to receive its Belgian block paving. The second vessel that they had was the Elizabeth Banscaver built right at Adams Wharf in Willingboro. She was a very large vessel and uh, when they found out that she really wasn't suitable for the Rancocas, they sent her down to operate in the Philadelphia Smyrna Transportation Company uh, that was running service between Smyrna and Philadelphia. But eventually she was sold to Stonington, Connecticut, where the new owners renamed her the Islander. That's a large vessel to be sailing the Rancocas. So this is the first Annie L. Van Scarver. She was built in, uh, 1897 by Nipi and Levy in Kensington. Um, by 19, the, uh, the Van Scarver line had sold her to the Maine Central Railroad, who renamed her to Samoset, used her for a ferry. She ended up being in uh, naval service during the First World War. Uh, another vessel that the Van Scarver lines had was a freight boat called the Admiral, built in 1903 in, in Wilmington, Delaware. And then they had the second Annie L. Van Skyver built by uh, Dialogue Shipyard in 1905 at a cost of $32,000. Uh, she was staunch enough to break through the ice on the Red Cocos in the wintertime. Looks like she's battling her way uh, up the creek right there in that view. This was her main pier in Riverside uh, above the bridge. There, that little uh, cable group uh, warehouse was says on a Van Skyver line. And they're at that dock and they're loading up uh, plenty of summer revelers to uh, take an excursion. Another view from the, from the creek side. They carried a band. And then they, the Admiral would go up and down the creek as a freight boat. In the background is a Ridgeway shoe factory in Delanco. They had a replacement building. And this is the Annie. The Annie was the last boat they acquired. Uh, she was built in 1899 in Pocomoke City as the E. James Cole. Um, and and uh, Van Skyver Lines bought her in 1907 and brought her up to the rank of this for kind of the, the last hurrah of steamboat service on the creek. Although last passenger service, I should say, because uh, you also had steam tugs running up down the creek hauling sand and gravel and, and particularly marl. Uh, this is the tugboat Minerva, uh, who, who operated for the uh, J.W. Paxson Company. Uh, it was very famous for its foundry supplies, including uh, uh, foundry sand, which they mined off the Rancocas. The Rancocas was, uh, had a worldwide reputation of having the finest molding sand available anywhere. So again, the Minerva is going down past the little houses in Delanco. We come around back onto the uh, Delaware and stopped at the Delanco Pier. Uh, it's not really, really kind of fell out of use um, other than for Sunday school picnics and the like. So, you know, one of the lists of like later on, they, they discontinued Delanco. Um, and I'm running along the riverfront there. And then we're getting up to Beverly, New Jersey, founded originally as Dunk's Ferry in the 18th century. Uh, Beverly grew to, uh, uh, during the early 19th century. There were a lot of cord waiters or shoemakers here. 
Um, and, and this two-story warehouse was actually built for when the Wilson line invaded the upper Delaware. So the Bristol can't stop there. Captain of Bristol Gray, who all the uh, farmers do for carrying their baskets of produce down to Philadelphia. And of course, all the little wharf rats knew him as well. We're passing the cove where they had food. And the yacht club is over there to the right. There's a shot standing up on in the and looking back. And the, one of the band scabber boats passing uh, Edgewater Park. And passing through a park we wanted in, uh, in the 1850s as a, another resort for uh, means who would stay here in the summer. Uh, my father often is a town for and this was an observation tower that one of the mansions along the river had. The mansions are glorious if you can see them from the riverside. So now we're approaching the city of Burlington and some of the first things you see are St. Mary's Hall uh, after you pass the Burlington, what today is the Burlington Bristol Bridge. And, uh, and we're riding along this, this road is known as Delaware Avenue or more, or, or the older name for it is Green Bank. This is Barbara's Wharf, which dates to the 18th century. And here comes the Bristol again with Captain Dave on board, passing the Pirate's Tree. This is supposedly the, the tree that the uh, ship shield tied up to when it brought its first uh, arrivals from uh, England to arrive in Burlington. Uh, they supposedly lashed this tray and later stories have it that um, Blackbeard buried treasure underneath or near it. Uh, the tree no longer exists, it was struck by lightning, uh, but there's a big hole in the ground where it once stood. In the back there, you can see a steamer tied up to the Burlington Pier. And there is that pier. You can see the small ferry boat that William E. Doran making the crossing over to Bristol. Had his own right there in this combination of, uh, of pier and and, uh, and and other buildings necessary for river ride uh, transportation. And here's Columbia pulling up to that pier ahead of her is the band scabber boat. Another shot at Columbia there. And the ever present willow tree uh, out on Barbaro's Wharf. And here's the twilight. And this is from the land side of it. You can see the uh, uh, the ferry slip is there on the left uh, and the steamboat uh, landing is there on the right. Lots of uh, lots of baskets of truck there going, going to Philadelphia. Here's the William E. Doran. Uh, the William E. Doran replaced his father's ferry, the Elwood Doran. Um, and this boat was built in 1893 by Neepy and Levy in Kensington. Um, they, Billy Doran, as he was affectionately known, uh, gave up uh, service the day the contract for the Burlington Bristol Bridge was signed. And the boat was sold to uh, somebody down in Virginia that was going to start a ferry service or had a ferry service. And on the way down, a storm ar arose. And today, the William E. Doran sits on the bottom of the Atlantic. There's a steamer Columbia tied up in, uh, in uh, Bristol. There's the freight warehouse behind her. She's tied up at the Mill Street Pier. And over there on the right is the uh, William E. Doran pulled into the slip. And of course, they also received shipments uh, uh, by other vessels. This is a uh, two-masted scooter, which is bringing either regular hay or even salt hay up from Jersey and it's being offloaded here onto these big hay wagons. Right. Here's the steamer Burlington. Of course, it's the John A. Werner renamed. In Columbia at the Mill Street uh, Pier, which is still there today. It's one of only two piers left on the river that, um, uh, that served the steamboats, the other being, of course, Riverton. There's the William E. Doran and the uh, 
the twilight tied up the freight pier. And here's the steamer passing Bristol. And this is the uh, uh, the boat, the Trenton, tied up at the pier for Burlington Island. Burlington Island was a major amusement park, major attraction for traveling by steamboat. And we're going to get off and, and take a walk. You can see uh, you can see that Burlington, the steamer Burlington, and all the women dressed in their whites, uh, waiting to get on the boat or getting off the boat. You can't quite tell. Uh, ladies in the, the rowboat in the foreground both have uh, umbrellas up, so it must be a very warm day. And here's the steamer Dolphin. Dolphin operated for the Dolphin Line, which was owned by the Roebling family. And uh, uh, they operated that until 1916. And here's the Queen Anne, originally built for service on the Chesapeake. She came up and was running on the Salem Philadelphia route for quite a while. In the background, uh, you can see the Grundy Mansion over in Bristol. The wharf is just mobbed with people getting off and headed into the park. And this is what they were greeted with. This is the entrance to it. You can see the uh, floating dock to the left there with all the canoes that you could rent. They had a major bathing beach. Canoes galore in the background. You can see uh, part of the gray, Greyhound uh, roller coaster or scenic railway. Another view, you can get a little better view of the scenic railway there. And of course the carousel house there on the, on the right. Another, another steamer looks like they're loading up towards the end of the day. And some of the people in the water and, and canoes pulled up on the beach. Have a wicker perambulator in the foreground here with a baby in it. Everybody was seeking relief from the heat. So, by being in the trees, they got relief from the sun. All the pleasure boats. In this particular view, uh, if, you, if you see up there on the upper right, um, that is the uh, Merchant Shipbuilding Corporation built by E.H. Harriman uh, for building World War I uh, merchant vessels for the uh, Emergency Fleet Corporation. And here we are, we're rowboat, canoes, going past the beach. All the women are dressed in their white uh, summer garb. The, the, the bathing house allowed people to get changed into bathing suits and have a, a locker to put their street clothes. There we have a float plane pulled up to the beach. And some of the guys fishing out on the pier. The beach was very, very popular. This is uh, the road into the actual park, past the gate. Now this was one of the early rides that was there. This is called a razzle dazzle. And uh, uh, they had different days within the park to attract more people. Sorry, folks. But this part, this ride originally came from Rancocas Woods, uh, Rancocas Park over in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And you can see it there in the background. Uh, George Potts was, was uh, entreated to bring it over to the island. They told him he could make more money on the island. And I suppose he did for a while until they began bringing on other bigger and better amusements. So they had a miniature railway on the island, complete with a camelback locomotive, similar to what the Reading operated. You can see the guys with their paddles for their canoes. And this was a hobo band that was appearing on the island and they're riding on the cars of that train. This is a, similar to a razzle dazzle, dazzle, this is called a tilt world and you would ride on those park benches and it would, would not only go around, but also tilt back and forth. Here's the roller coaster, the Greyhound, uh, quite a popular ride, quite an undulation to it. And it even had a, uh, a, uh, a tunnel of love so that you could steal a kiss from your girlfriend or your wife without anybody seeing it. 
There's a Ferris wheel and an airship ride. They had every amusement on the island that you can think of. This was called the whip. It was like a riding chair that got spun around, the chair spun, and then it would go around on that wheel. There's a close up of it here. And here's the midway. Games of chance of all kinds. And the park was a regular for Sunday school uh, uh, parties. Um, Grace Presbyterian and Bethany Baptist were from East Camden, New Jersey. And it uh, looks like they're having a fine time at uh, Burlington Island Park. Baseball, very popular at the time. And just a couple taking it easy in front of the casino. Well, uh, it got to be uh, 1926 and the Wilson line wanted to get into the act. And so they decided to uh, take their city of Chester boot and run that for excursions up to the island. And here's the brochure that was issued for that. And they're pointing out all the, the uh, areas of interest along the trip. And this was the city of Chester. Well, there was a bad fire hit the island in 32, and a second fire hit it in 34. And the only ride we covered was the carousel, uh, which was taken up to uh, Seaside Heights and restored lovingly. It's still there today. Uh, there was some talk of selling the animals, but uh, that was, uh, that didn't happen. And so now they have it uh, restored again. And it's, uh, I believe it's back operating but this originally stood on Burlington Island. So as we pick our way up through the yacht fleet to continue our trip north, uh, here's the Columbia and the MA Clay. Uh, the Columbia serving the floating grandstand for the uh, Anchor Yacht Club race. In the foreground is the, uh, the Quay is serving as the stake boat. And in the foreground is an incredible NASA launch. That thing looks like it's going 100 miles an hour standing still. And there's a view of the Anchor Yacht Club, which was up, up above, just above the main part of Bristol. So as we leave uh, Bristol behind, and you can see the wake here coming off the stern. We're continuing our trip up the river. And there's the steamer Florence, originally built as a Silver Star. And uh, uh, she's photographed here off of her, uh, her uh, namesake. And Florence was well known for its pipe foundry, uh, R.D. Wood. And uh, this is the crane that could travel out over the water for loading and unloading ships. Uh, this is a scrap yard right here. You can see a three-masted scooter tied up there at the wharf for loading pipe. This was the big hotel. Originally, Florence was planned to be a, uh, the Delaware River end of a plank road between there and Keyport for transshipments of goods between the Delaware River and the Hudson. And um, so they built this gigantic hotel, uh, thinking that there would be all kinds of visitors and a need for people to stay in Florence. Uh, but the, the plank road never developed. And um, uh, this actually ended up becoming the, the town hall until 1972, I think it was, when it burned. Beautiful place. Um, the building on the left is the ticket office for the steamboats and the wharf is right there between the buildings. They're looking at the beach and up, up river there is a three masted schooner that's tied up at the Florence Heights um, uh, wharf. And uh, during, the, during the week they would load brick, a lot of brick made at Florence Heights. Um, and then during the, during the summer in this, on, on Saturdays and Sundays, you'd hear the patter of little feet going to Sunday school picnics. Uh, during the 19th century, Charles Hygiene Home and Hygiotherapeutic College was stood up on the bluff and uh, again destroyed by a disastrous fire. Another view coming up into Roebling, New Jersey. This was the boat landing for Roebling. You can see the steamer right off the uh, landing. They have a 
some pilings there to serve as a wharf. And this was the Roebling plant at a, at a tight. You can see the steamboat landing down on the lower right. And uh, they were also had barge loading up in the center there. Um, Roebling was a fully integrated uh, paternalistic town. Almost all the housing stock still remains. Unfortunately, the plant was demolished for uh, super as a super fun site. Uh, but the EPA funded the restoration of the of the uh, gatehouse, and that today serves as the museum for the town of Roebling. Wonderful place if you haven't visited it. And then moving a little further up in the key corner, this was one of the giant ice houses that belonged to the Knickerbocker Ice Company. Um, strange thing, but ice houses had, had a habit of burning. And I believe this one was destroyed by fire as well. And then, of course, in uh, White Hill, or today, Fieldsboro, uh, you had the Union Steam Forge that belonged to McPherson Willard and Company. The, the Camden Amboy ran right in front of it, and of course it had lots of warpage for loading uh, vessels. There's a tugboat tied up there. You know, it's a, it's a poor image. This is an 1876 photograph of the Camden and Amboy shop complex in, in uh, White Hill. And there's another view of the shop complex. Lots of little four wheel. Jimmy coal cars in the foreground there. And Columbia is continuing upriver. And we've arrived in Bordentown. This is the uh, mouth of Crosswicks Creek, also the entrance lock to the Delaware and Rarity Canal. The, the area right here inside the mouth of the creek served as the canal basin. Uh, the white structure over on the left was for loading uh, cattle on the barges going down to the slaughterhouses in West Philadelphia. Another view of one of the freight boats coming through the uh, through the entrance lock, going out into the Delaware River. It looks like it might be the FW Brew. You have a couple barges tied up there along the uh, shore. There's another view taken in 1886. If you look closely at the uh, trestle, uh, there's, there's a couple of small A-frames there. And that's because they used to be able to open the trestle for uh, truck produce boats going up and down Crosswicks Creek all the way to Crosswicks. So, uh, of course, they were born today. The trestle is still in use. That, that location is still in use uh, for the river line. Uh, again, the structure to the left of the A-frames is uh, for loading cattle in the barges. Um, the steamer you see over on the far shore is actually backed into more or less the site of the original rock, uh, which was done away with when they built the Bordentown branch uh, with the trestle in 1838. And there's a couple of steamers tied up in the canal basin. And there's the steamer Bristol, probably waiting an excursion. Tugboat Harford ahead of her. Harford came off the Chesapeake. And uh, it was a regular visit on the Delaware River. These two little girls are, are uh, just wondering what's going on with the photographer. Now, Board Town had a lot of trouble getting um, regular service because, of course, they had to pull into the canal basin in order for steamers to provide service to Board Town. So they, in 1899, they formed the Board Town Transportation Company and had the steamer Springfield built uh, down in Delaware. And she had a steel hull. And uh, she would battle her way up and down the river all year long. And even as late as midnight, you could hear her breaking through the ice, trying to get back to Bordentown. She was an amazing staunch vessel. Iron works to the, to the right. And off to the left, you can see the canal making its way up to Trenton. And we're Probably end of Trenton. The, the house up on the block there is a, is a boathouse that uh, rented out boats. In the background, you can see the railroad bridge, the viaduct over the Delaware. And there's a better picture of that house where they rented the boats. There's the Burlington, uh, Seymour Burlington tied up at the old Trenton Pier.
and there's the railroad uh, viaduct with a train crossing it. That was the de facto head of navigation for uh, going up to Delaware to Trenton. Uh, but in point of fact, the tidal flow stopped here at the Trenton Falls, which was above the bridges. And you can see that today from Route 29 or over on the Pennsylvania side over in Marsville. And that's just a collection of rocks that that the end of the tidal flow. So here's the steamboat first leaving the wharf at Trenton and headed back downriver. Well, in August 1st of 1911, the steamer Burlington, at first they thought it hit the Periwitch. Periwitch Shoal was in the bottom of the river just above Bordentown. Um, and its presence caused the steamers to leave at a different time each day if they were going to Trenton because they had to make sure they crossed the Periwitch Shoal at high tide. Um, but it turns out that the, uh, there was an anchor on the bottom from uh, a dredge that was operating nearby and it tore some plates out of the bottom of the hole in the Burlington and uh, down she went. Uh, there was a nearby government barge and tugboat and they used the barge, the mud barge to get people off of the, uh, uh, the vessel, the stricken vessel and take them uh, to uh, Trent, back to Trenton. So she was quite a sight to see for a while. Very, uh, very popular for people with boats to uh, have their photo taken on board. Another view over here, this is, um, uh, you can see how close she was to the mud flats. Well, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers declared her a hazard of nav to navigation and they stripped her of all of her superstructure and they took the hull, which was made of charcoal iron, which will never rust. Um, and they pushed her on to Biles Island on the Pennsylvania side. And it has been the subject in the 1980s and 1990s of several underwater archeology span investigations, but she's still there sunken in the mud. This was pretty much the end of uh, the uh, Delaware River Transportation Company, unfortunately. But of course, there were the other steamers, the Dolphin and the, uh, the Queen Anne and the, the Wilson Line that continued to service um, into the 20s. They've already got her pushed up onto the shore. So it is time, it's been a long day, it's time to get back to Philadelphia. As the moon shines down on the river here, I thank you for your kind attention to steamboats on the upper Delaware River and I bid you farewell. And please watch your step going down the gangplank. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I learned a lot and it looks like we have some questions. Uh, start with the first one. How deep did the river have to be to float the steamer? Um, most of them drew about 12 feet of water and the river was naturally about 20 to 25 feet before dredging operations began. Of course, they began dredging in the uh, in earnest in 1899. Why did the river service decline before the car became popular? Can you repeat that for me, Cindy? Why did river service decline before the car became popular? Um, primarily because of the railroads. The railroads supplanted the steamers. I mean, when they founded the town of Riverton, for example, they didn't really care about the railroad, even though it went through the back end of the town. They were only concerned about the steamboat service, which is why they built a pier almost immediately. What is the greatest draft of these vessels? How uh, deep was the river going north? Yeah. Well, the river going north was, was always a little bit problematic, but I, I would say that the draft for, well, the, the, the depth of the river was probably 15 to 20 feet at low tide, and they normally tried to get, go at high tide. And, and most of the uh, drafts of these vessels was in the area of 12 feet. Okay. Could you talk about the importance of the sand business on the Rococos 
What was it used for and how long did it operate? Who owned sure. it? Sure, sure. Um, okay, so there's actually three kinds of sand in the rank focus. Um, the molding sand, of course, is the most important. Um, very, very, uh, very well noted for its uh, fine qualities. And, uh, and then there was construction sand. Um, and then the further out the rank focus went, you know, came across filtration sand, like was put into the tortoise sale filtration plant in Philadelphia. Uh, that, most of that sand came off the rank focus. The, um, uh, the molding sand was primarily gained from um, right around the Centerton area in, in, uh, in Mount Laurel. Uh, the building sand came from uh, the, the forks. Um, it was started to be in, in George and J.D. Vanskyver formed the Eastport Mine Transportation Company, and they began to uh, take the sand off the points, reducing portions of the point, 34 foot bluff down to almost water level. Um, and then they later made uh, uh, sand at, became Olympia Lakes along Route 130 in Willingboro. Uh, and that was uh, that was mined out for, uh, uh, again, construction in Philadelphia. They used to say that if you wanted to see uh, indigenous people artifacts, Philadelphia and look like some of the buildings from, because they were all dredged out. So they're interested in knowing if there's any steamboat or paddle boat tours, get, uh, tours given on the Delaware River. Um, we gave, gave uh, quite a number of tours back in 2008, I believe it was. But as far as I know, there's a, that was a vessel that was kept in Bristol. Um, what they call the River Queen or something like that. Uh, but I'm, I'm not aware of any vessels that come up to this area anymore. On the Bristol side, was there a junction similar to the Bordentown that intersected with the Delaware Canal? Absolutely. Yeah, I did not include a picture of that uh, of, of that basin and entrance lock, but I do have I do have one in my collection. Most of the side wheelers appear to be single cylinder. If so, was dead center a problem? No, because uh, they had a they had a mechanism uh, that prevented reaching dead center when they came to a stop. Okay. Here's another one. There's a couple questions about if we're being recorded and we are, uh, and it will be posted on our website under past events. Uh, here's another question. How did you get so many photos and postcards and how did you gain so much information on this topic? Well, I've been collecting for 50 years. And as far as gaining so much information, research, 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 reading, reading, reading. Yeah, you've been at it a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't see any more questions. Okay. So I guess we can wrap it up and just wanted to say thank you so much. I greatly enjoyed listening and I I see a lot of people also said thank you and they enjoyed the presentation and the visuals. Uh, thank you everybody for attending and I hope you have a wonderful evening. All right. Thank you. Take care. Yep.